has also expired. So for those of us who are able to get up and come back and forth, uh, we are going to take uh, about 10 minutes. I would ask the witnesses, you can either go through that door or this door to use uh, facilities that are available there without going out into the public, and then we will reconvene in about 10 minutes. Thank you.
Okay. Now, I, I happen to know that 10 minutes is five minutes of break and five minutes of everyone getting back to their seats. So if everyone that wants to remain here would please take a seat, we'll get started. The committee will come to order again. I've been advised that we expect to have votes on the House floor approximately 5 o'clock. We can work till about five minutes into those votes. After that, we will adjourn. The expectation is we will not come back. So for our three witnesses, for the families and for uh, the, uh, the attorneys, let me assure you the end is in sight. With that, we go to the gentlelady from Wyoming, Mrs. Loomis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, too, want to thank you, gentlemen, for this long day and for the families. I offer my most sincere condolences from my constituents. They think about you all the time. Um, first question, Mr. Nordstrom. Uh, now, do I understand you had responsibility for security in Libya while you were there? That's correct. And then you left in July, is that correct? That's correct. Now, before you left, uh, did you make security recommendations to Washington, D.C.? Uh, no, I'm, well, uh, we do an out, uh, a turnover report, um, but that's not really uh, a place where we put recommendations. It's more laying out the situation, the crime, the political uh, situation and a lot of that reporting I had done previously uh, with with Washington. And so you, they had recommendations from you, or not? Uh, it's my understanding. Yes, uh, they had wanted a transition plan specifically on how we were going to transition from the SST and the DS agents to our local bodyguards. That was submitted to them uh, February fifteenth. And do you know where those? That, was that implementation plan accepted? Was it implemented? Uh, I never really got any feedback from Washington. Uh, that was one of the things that, that surprised me even when I left post. Uh, I was never contacted by DS uh, leadership or management from the date I left on the 26th to this date. Um, the only time I had any interaction was preparing uh, before the October hearings, but they've never contacted me to ask me on thoughts about uh, Libya, suggestions, uh, anything like that. Mr. Hicks, do you know whether uh, security recommendations were implemented? Were there security recommendations that were implemented? John Martinek, the R RRSO, came on board and he was following up on many of the things that that uh, Eric was working on before to strengthen our security posture in in Libya after the attack tax uh, John and I worked on on a list of physical security improvements that had to be made in Tripoli uh, in order for us to remain there and I cabled that in that list into the department after Congressman Chaffetz's visit 
and I learned later that that cable was not well received by Washington leadership. To the ARB's credit, when they saw that cable, they sent it to, un to Undersecretary Kim uh, Kennedy and insisted that every recommendation in that cable be implemented. Thank you. I want to I switch gears a little bit. Uh, Mr. Hicks, are you aware of any efforts by department officials to limit department witnesses' access to information about the attack prior to their testimony before Congress? I have never seen the classified ARB report. So the answer is, in my respect, yes. Mr. Nordstrom, do you know whether the State Department consciously sought to limit your awareness of certain information prior to your testimony before this committee? I'm not aware of that. Let me, let me ask you this, Mr. Nordstrom. I want to read you an excerpt from an email Ambassador Stevens sent to you and a colleague on July 5, 2012. The email concerned a draft cable intended to request an extension of security personnel for the embassy, which was ultimately sent on July 9th. Now, the ambassador wrote, Gentlemen, I have taken a close look at the cable and edited it down and rearranged some paragraphs. My intention was to give more focus to what we are doing to end our reliance on TDY support and to let the department figure out how to staff our needs. If it looks okay, please re run it by DS and see if they want it front channel. Then, Mr. Nordstrom, can you briefly explain what Ambassador Stevens meant when he asked you to run it by DS and see if they wanted it front channel? What he's referring to is uh, the process by which we would send an official State Department cable. Um, I had done that for prior requests, uh, and it was my ad advice uh, to the ambassador, I do remember that dialogue, that we, that we do in fact send that front channel. Uh, within the Department of State, that is considered to be the official record. If I sent something by email or informally discussed it by telephone, it's still valuable, but unless it's on that cable, uh, it's not official. My experience in the, in the past was that as soon as we put those recommendations, just as Greg just alluded to, as soon as we put that on to an official cable, somehow we were seen as embarrassing the Department of State because we are requiring them to live up to their end of the bargain. I thank the gentlelady. We now go to the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Woodall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll add my thanks to the uh, gentleman on the panel. I know you've heard that over and over and over again from members uh, here, but only because uh, 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 folks believe it. Uh, and, uh, and we're grateful to you, not just for being here today, but for your uh, decade upon decade of service. I'll tell you, Mr. Uh, Thompson, I'm I'm comforted, and I know folks uh, uh, at U.S. posts across the uh, world are comforted uh, that there are men and women who do what you do, uh, who live by a code that says, uh, if you're in harm's way, we're going to come for you. For you. Uh, just hang on. Uh, and I, I, I thank you very much uh, uh, for that commitment. Thank you. The, Mr. Nordstrom, my questions are followed up on uh, my colleague uh, uh, from Wyoming. Thinking back to, to early July 2012, um, uh, you recall your your back and forth with Charlene Lamb, uh, uh, particularly vividly. Um, what did you think of that decision-making um, uh, process? Were those decisions that Ms. Lamb was making, or were those decisions being kicked up to a higher level? Uh, it, it was unclear. Uh, I think largely uh, vast Lamb, uh, but one thing that that struck me throughout the entire uh, time that I was in Libya was uh, a strange uh, strange decision-making. Um, uh, process. Specifically, uh, again, the Under Secretary for, for Management in many ways was dealing directly with Das Lam. As her supervisor two levels ahead, obviously he has that, that ability to do that. He's well within his right. Um, but it was strange that there was that direct relationship and I never really saw uh, interaction from Assistant Secretary of DS Eric Boswell or our director. Um, Scott Boltrowitz. Um, it was even more clear in October when we were all sitting up here, there was two levels, if you will, that were not reflected. And 
and it was quite a jump between Das Lamb and, and Undersecretary Kennedy. So I, certainly I, I felt that, that anything that Das Lamb was deciding certainly had been run by Undersecretary Kennedy. Mm -hmm. And given the, the seriousness of, of that conversation, thinking about extending SSD and, and MSD as the security support, did you receive an explanation for why that request was denied that satisfied you? Uh, I didn't. Uh, as I testified before, um, you know, what I perceived that it was some sort of um, uh, explained to me that it would be somehow embarrassing or politically uh, difficult for State Department to continue to rely on DOD. Um, and that there was an element of that. Um, I, that was never fully verbalized, uh, but that was certainly the, the feeling that I got uh, going away from those conversations. Okay. And then following up on uh, uh, moving these discussions from back channel to, to front channel, uh, what was the nature of your conversation with uh, the ambassador uh, that this was such a serious uh, uh, issue that rather than leaving it with a no on back channels, he wanted to, to elevate that? Uh, that's that's exactly what it is. In fact, uh, I recall all the way back to our first meeting with uh, with uh, Congressman Chaffetz and, and, and the chairman. Uh, that was some. That was the question that I think they posed to me: is well, if if you knew she was going to keep saying no, why did you keep asking? Well, because it was the right thing to do, and it was the resources that were needed. And if people also on the other side felt that that was the right thing to do to say no to that, they could at least have the courtesy to put that in the official record. And did you receive any feedback back from Washington, whether a direct response to that cable or a back channel response to the to the fact that you elevated it to this uh, this front channel uh, process? By the time that we sent the one in July, no, I did not receive a response. In fact, that cable, as I understand, was never responded to, which is something that is is relatively unheard of in the State Department. When you send a request cable for anything, whether it's copiers or resource or manpower, mm -hmm. they get back to you. Um, Prior discussions, back channel ones, yes, I had a number of call, uh, conversations with my regional director and also Das Lamb where it was uh, discouraging, to put it, to put it mildly, um, that why do you keep raising these issues? Why do you keep putting this forward? And if you can characterize it uh, then between a, a non-response or a disagreement, uh, when it comes to these issues of security for American personnel on the ground in, in Libya, were you receiving a, a non-response from Washington or was there disagreement in Washington with your assessment of, of uh, levels of need on the ground? Uh, I largely get a, a non-response. Um, the, the responses that I did uh, get were you don't have specific targeting, you don't have specific threats against you. Uh, the long and short of it is you're not dealing with suicide bombers, uh, incoming artillery, and uh, vehicle bombs like they are in Iraq and Afghanistan. So basically stop complaining. Uh, the gentleman's time has expired. Thank is there you, anything else in answer? Okay, I uh, thank you. We now go to the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Davis. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I know that it's been a long day and lots of questions and answers have uh, been shared. But let me ask uh, you gentlemen this. Last week, an unidentified individual who was described as a military special ops member appeared on national television to give an interview on the military's response to the attacks in Benghazi. The man appeared behind a black screen in order to conceal his identity. He suggested that military assets in Europe could have prevented the second attack in Benghazi. Specifically, he said this, I know for a fact that C-110, the UCOM, European Command, CIF Commanders and Extremist Force, was doing a training exercise not in the region of North Africa, but in Europe and they had the ability to react and respond. He further stated, we have the ability to load out, get on birds, that is aircraft, and fly there at a minimum stage. C-110 had the ability to be there, in my opinion, in four to six hours. He then went on to conclude that they would have been there before the second attack. Let me ask if any of you gentlemen are familiar with this claim. Yeah, I've, I've seen. I, I saw it on television. Yes. 
All right. In, in order to investigate the claim, last week Ranking Member Cummins wrote a letter to Secretary Hagar asking for the Defense Department's response. We have now received that written response from the Department, and I would like to enter that letter into the record, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we, when we have it, we will take it under advisement. Right. I haven't seen it yet. In regards to the anonymous allegation that the CIF could have arrived in Benghazi prior to the initiation of the second attack on the annex, the time needed from alerting the CIF to landing at the Benghazi airport is greater than the approximately seven and a half hours between the initiation of the first attack and that of the second one. The letter also says this. The time requirements for notification, load, and transit alone prevented the CIF from being at the annex in time enough to change events. Does anyone disagree with that statement? I think the only thing I would add to that, not being privy to the decisions on the ground on that day, what is valuable is none of us, including the committee, had those details but for that person coming forward and making that allegation. Um, I think that is the, the, the point that uh, majority, uh, minority um, Mr. Cummings made, is that it is important to get these questions raised in this format. Otherwise, we are going to continue to see those same kinds of allegations, because people do not um, feel that the answers uh, have been provided or that those answers have been provided in a credible way. So I think it is much more important to get it done in, in this manner. Thank you very much. Uh, the Defense Department's letter appears to be consistent with the ARB report, which said this, and I quote, the Board found no evidence of any undue delays in decision-making or denial of support from Washington or from the military combatant commanders. Quite the contrary. The safe evacuation of all U.S. government personnel from Benghazi 12 hours after the initial attack and subsequently to Ramstein Air Force Base was the result of exceptional U.S. government coordination and military response and helped save the lives of two severely wounded Americans. So I don't know who that unidentified individual was on Fox News, but according to the Defense Department, his claim is incorrect. And so, Mr. Chairman, I simply wanted to get that into the record. And Would, thank you very much. Will the gentleman yield? Will the gentleman yield? Yes. Would the gentleman yield? Yes. Oh, thank you. Um, I believe you yield to me. I'm correct? yielding to, to, to Ms. Maloney. Oh, thank you. Oh. Th thank you very much. Um, by all accounts, uh, Ambassador Stevens was a remarkable man. and. Uh, I wonder, was he aware how dangerous it was in Benghazi? And Mr. Hicks, were you aware how dangerous it was, yet he still made the decision to go there? Uh, is that lady, correct? The gentleman's time has expired. Okay. You may answer. Yes, the ambassador was very well aware of the security mm -hmm. situation in Benghazi. Before he went, we had the chance to outbrief uh, Eric Gaudiosi, the departing principal officer. Thank you. We now go to the gentleman from Kentucky, Kucky, Mr. Massey. Mr. Chairman, thank you for holding these hearings. Mr. Chairman, it has been said that all that is necessary for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing. But I submit to you we have three very good men here who are going beyond the call of duty to come here and testify today. They have my commitment to protect them from any retribution that may come from this. And I get the sense that there may be other people listening to this testimony today that have answers that we don't have yet. And I would encourage them to come forward as well. We have got a lot of good answers today thanks to these witnesses. Um, I would like to start with Mr. Thompson. I am struck by your long and distinguished career of uh, hostage rescue missions. And uh, some of these missions are still classified, but were successful. Um, you were, can you remind us where you were when these events began to unfold? At my desk in the State Department. So you were at your desk at the State Department, and um, you asked to marshal the resources and the team to, to help with the uh, rescue effort, defense effort, did you not? Yes, my first call was to um, the National Security Council, my RCT contacts there. 
And they, uh, in your testimony, you stated that you were told this was not the right time. Is that correct? When I referred that question to the Under Secretary for Management's office, yes. Okay. Uh, if this wasn't the right time, when would be the right time? Because this is the source of frustration that the American public has, that, that I have. Um, we are the greatest country in the world, and we left people there, uh, Mr. Hicks and, and uh, Mr. Stevens, to essentially defend for themselves. And when we had these resources, mm -hmm. when would be the right time if this weren't the right time? There is no answer to that, sir. Well, staying on that topic of time, uh, would it have been a reasonable thing in an uncertain situation such as this crisis where we don't know how it is going to unfold to go ahead and assemble that team and put them on a plane? Were there sufficient communications on a plane that you could have pulled back a mission uh, that was ready to deploy? We, um, we practice this all, uh, tw at least twice a year, as in a, a, a complete uh, deployment to an overseas location to work with our interagency partners. And the team, obviously, again, is, is um, uh, staffed with interagency pr uh, CT professionals. The answer to your question is yes, that plane, which is uh, funded by DOD, has a robust communication suite. Uh, the communicator, the ch senior communicator on there works for me, and he's uh, very competent at his job. Are, are you convinced, uh, I know you haven't been allowed to review or even contribute to the Account Accountability Review Board's report. But are you convinced that the changes have been made so that this won't happen again for another embassy? No. Okay, that's, that's troubling to me, um, and uh, I appreciate your candor. Mr. Hicks, you mentioned that at 2 a.m. you had a phone conversation with Mrs. Uh, Secretary Clinton. Is that correct? Yes. Sir. At any time during that conversation, did she uh, ask uh, what resources you might be able to use or might need? Yes, she did. Uh, I asked for security reinforcements and, and uh, transport aircraft to move our medical, our uh, wounded out of the country to medical facility. Um, was there any indication that you would receive uh, air support? She indicated that the Marine FAST team was being deployed to bolster our security posture in Tripoli and that a C-17 would be coming, from, coming down to take people back. But, but no immediate military response? Well, the Marines were on their way, and they would be arriving on the, later in, on the 12th. Okay. Um, did you tell the Accountability Review Board about Secretary Clinton's, Secretary Clinton's interest in establishing a permanent presence in Benghazi? Because ostensibly, wasn't that the reason that the ambassador was going to Benghazi? Yes, I did tell the uh, Accountability Review Board that uh, Secretary Clinton wanted the post made permanent. Uh, Ambassador Pickering was surprised. He looked both ways on the, to the members of the board saying, does the seventh floor know about this? And another factor in Chris's decision was our understanding that Secretary Clinton intended to visit Tripoli so in Pickering, December. Pickering was surprised that uh, this was, his mission was to establish a permanent facility there? Yes. That's your impression? Yes. Please. Okay. Um, I thank you uh, for your time. I thank the witnesses. Would, would the gentleman yield? Yes, I yield. I just want you to say it unambiguously, if that's the correct way to say it without a flaw. One more time. The reason the ambassador was in Benghazi, at least one of the reasons, was X. At, at least one of the reasons he was in Benghazi was to further the Secretary's wish that that post become a permanent constituent post, and also there because we understood that the Secretary intended to visit Tripoli later in the year. We hoped that she would be able to announce to the Libyan people our establishment of a permanent constituent post in Benghazi at that time. Thank you. Will the gentleman thank, yield? Thank the gentleman for yielding. Thank you, Mr. We uh, now go to the gentleman from Georgia. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. Uh, thanks for being here today. And it's been a, it's been a long day, and I think there's been some interesting things said, and there's been a lot of questions. One of the things that was said earlier today that sort of concerns me a little bit, it says that these hearings have not found a smoking gun, I believe is a, even a warm slingshot. 
Well, I, for one, and the folks of the 9th District of Georgia, where I represent, are not looking for those things. They're looking for the truth. They're looking for what happened that night. Because the one thing we have found, it may not be a smoking gun or a warm slingshot, but we have four dead Americans. And that's what this is about. That's about finding the, what happened in the past so that we can move forward in the future. And I appreciate your willingness to be here and these families who are willing to do this, because truth is important, even in this town. It's important. I want to ask a follow-up question. Mr. Nordstrom, I want to follow up on a question from Mr. Langford earlier about a March 28th cable asking for more security. He asks you about your intended recipients of that cable. Now, did you expect Secretary Clinton to either, either have read or to be briefed about that cable? Absolutely. I, I certainly expected, um, given the fact that she had an involvement in the security process, if I could take a step back, <clears throat> by virtue of uh, having the SST teams there, because they were a Department of Defense asset, the process required for that is, is something called an exec sec. That exec sec is a, literally a request from one cabinet head to another, in this case, state to DOD. That request must be signed by the cabinet head, mm -hmm. Secretary Clinton. She would have done that, uh, the initial deployment request, uh, plus an extension in the fall, and, and a second extension in February. She also came out to post toward our facilities, toward the facilities, and, we, and, and saw the, the lack of security there. That was something that her country team, uh, or she was briefed by the country team as she visited the site. Um, we also saw later there was the attacks against the facility. Certainly there's a reasonable expectation that her staff would have briefed her on those, on those points. I think it was you that said earlier, could this be a concern about a DOD presence and an embarrassment? with state on a embassy and a real short answer there? That, that was how I, I took away That's from, why you took it. Right, from right. DASLAM. Right. Thank you. Um, uh, Mr. Hicks, I have a, a question. We'll go back. It's been asked here a little bit before. In discussions about a permanent presence in Benghazi, uh, give me sort of a quick flavor of what was those discussions like? Was it said, you do this? How was that, how was it going out? In, Chris told me that in his exit interview with the, with the secretary after he was sworn in, the secretary said, we need to make Benghazi a permanent post. Okay. And Chris said, I'll make it happen. Okay. Uh, was Washington informed of the ambassador's plan to travel to Benghazi? Yes. Washington was fully informed that the ambassador was going to Benghazi. And we advised them August 22nd or thereabouts. Okay. Were there any concerns raised from that? No. In fact, given the, given the timing and everything? None. Okay. Um, based on your, Mr. Hicks, again, based on your experiences in Libya, do you believe that foreign service officers remain in avoidable danger in such high threat countries as Libya? Thanks. I, I believe that foreign service officers are serving their country where they need to be serving their country, and in some places, the risk that they are taking is very high. But could we, in light of what we're seeing now, be avoidable? in a sense of from our lessons learned, if you would. From a lesson, sorry, thanks. From a lessons learned standpoint, the security, we need to be increasing our security strength and, and practices and training. And so, again, I may not be quite understanding the question. Well, I, and I think what I'm saying is that what, if you had that situation, what would you need to be done to prevent something like this from happening again? Is that being taken advantage of? Or is there still sort of a denial process going on here? I think that we have more to do and than it, what has been put forth by the ARB and its recommendations. Okay. So as, as we move along, and, and I want to maybe ask you this question I asked earlier, is from, especially from a security standpoint, because it's something I think that we can flesh out over, over time, and maybe Mr. Thompson, if you want to jump in on this, is the, that DOD sort of influence uh, that has been mentioned by Mr. Norris a couple of times, uh, from the, the wanting to be permanent in the, in the area, was that, an, you know, was that embarrassment figure? Did you get that sense as well that we're trying to do this on our own? And Mr. Hicks, I'd like to hear you answer that as well. I never got that sense. That was, not, that was more Ms. Nordstrom. You did have that sense, though. Uh, again, that was specifically conveyed by, the, um, uh, by Das Lamb to both okay. me and to the prior DCM. Ms. Thompson, anything to add there? Uh, nothing in the context of uh, Good. Well, I do appreciate it. And again, like I said, it, this is the Institute of Truth. You've been providing that. I appreciate it. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. Uh, 
Mr. Meadows, um, as I yield to you, would, would you mind giving me about 10 seconds back? I will yield to the Chairman. Thank sir. you. I will be very brief. Uh, Mr. Hicks, uh, Colonel Wood in the previous hearing uh, with Mr. Nordstrom testified about trips back and forth of these people, these military people like the four that were told not to get on the plane, himself included. Uh, during your time as Deputy Chief of Mission, did those four men doing training ever go to Benghazi? No. Okay. Thank Not, you. Yeah, no. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. And thank each of you for uh, being here all day, day to day. And, and certainly, uh, as uh, Mr. Nordstrom started out this, you let us know clearly that this is not about politics. It's about people. And I just say thank you for that, because that's what it is. And to the families, I want to let you know that the people back home are standing with you. Uh, we had unbelievable questions that I'll submit to you uh, that we won't cover today in terms of asking them that we'll submit to you uh, for you to answer, but they're standing with you to get to the truth of this, and they will not sit down until those questions have been answered. And I thank the chairman for this, this uh, informative hearing. Uh, Mr. Thompson, let me go. You had talked earlier about the, the deployment of uh, the FEST team, and, as, and you said that you thought it was important to do that. Were there any other agencies that thought that, that other than you, that thought that was, that was important? Yes. Uh, the Federal Bureau of Investigation and uh, DOD specifically, uh, our SOCOM friends. So you're saying that it wasn't just you, but it, the DOD, so outside the State Department, the DOD and the FBI both felt like that that was the appropriate response to make sure that we, we provide that kind of uh, forces. People who are part of the team, a normal part of that team that deploy with us, were shocked and amazed that they were not being called uh, on their cell phones, beepers, et cetera, to go. Uh, whether or not that view was shared by uh, very senior people in those institutions, I do not know. All right, but, but the DOD and, and FBI uh, had a contradictory response to what the State Department's ultimate decision was to deploy. Well, again, the, the, the State Department doesn't make that decision. The, the National Security Council Deputies Committee uh, authorizes the deployment. So I think uh, what transpired was um, a strong enough um, conversation from our, our, uh, our department reps that uh, they were convinced that was not the thing to do. All right, Mr. Nordstrom, and let me go back to the ARB because we've, you know, everybody talks about how wonderful this process was. What I see it as narrow in scope, incomplete in its nature, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but earlier you talked about the ARB fixed blame, I think you said, on mid-level or those career employees, not those at a senior level or the political appointments. Is that correct? That is correct. So, and did you not say that that is where the decisions are made at that senior level? Uh, that is correct. And Master Pick Pickering asserted that it was made at the Assistant Secretary level and below. That is at variance with what I have personally seen. So you personally documents. believe that the decisions are made at a much higher level? And I see, uh, Mr. Hicks, you are nodding your head uh, <laughs> yes. Is that correct? Yes, I believe so. So, so the ARB, in, in looking to place blame on those career employees, ignored a whole lot of the, what you would say the decision makers in terms of uh, assigning blame. Is that absolutely. correct? Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. So both of you agree with that. All right, let yes. me go on a little bit further, Mr. Nordstrom. Uh, one last question, and then I'm going to yield to uh, the uh, gentleman from Utah. As we look at this, uh, is it fair that all the blame got assigned to the diplomatic security component? Aren't they just one component underneath the Management Bureau? Is that correct? Uh, that's absolutely correct. I don't, I don't believe it is fair. As I said, I, I think that uh, Certainly those resource determinations are made by the Under Secretary for Management. And so, so as, we, uh, as we look at that, when we start assigning blame, it's, uh, the ARB was incomplete in their analysis in terms of who was to blame for that uh, with regards to an agency. Is that correct? That's correct. I mean, you fix blame for the three people underneath the Under Secretary for Management, but nothing to him. So that either means he didn't know what was going on with his subordinates or he did and didn't care. All right. And there's some critical questions. I'm going well, to yield to the gentleman from Utah. Will the gentleman yield to the gentleman from South Carolina? 
Yeah, I'll be glad to yield to the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Gowdy. I thank the gentleman from North Carolina. I know I don't have much time, but Mr. Hicks, I want to set the table for the next round. Uh, September the 12th, 2012, did you receive an email from Beth Jones there that also copied Victoria Newland, William Burns, Patrick Kennedy, and Cheryl Mills? Did you, you're also in the distribution list. Do you recall receiving that email? Sorry, which, which email? I, uh, well, at that time this, I was receiving a couple hundred a day. A, a, and that's fair, and you had other things on your mind on September 12th. This one said, when he said his government suspected that former Gaddafi regime elements carried out the attacks, I told him that the group that conducted the attacks, Ansar al-Sharia, is affiliated with Islamic extremists. Do you recall that email? I do believe I recall that email. Okay. Uh, we'll now go to the gentleman from Michigan who may want to yield more time to the gentleman from South Carolina. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. As a veteran of Vietnam and Iraq, I understand that the boots on the ground are the closest to the truth in these situations. You know more about what happened in Benghazi than any bureaucrat or politician can. The fog of battle is easily blamed when mistakes are made at the highest level being caught between the political dictates of superiors in the chain of command and doing what is necessary to protect our citizens abroad is difficult. I understand the risk you have taken by showing up here today as well. Thank you for having the courage to testify before us. We are counting on you to reveal the truth about the failures of this government and to protect the men and women who served in Libya and how we can do a better job in the future. Mr. Thompson. Earlier, you mentioned that you hang out with some brave and honorable group. Are they Navy, Army, Air Force, Marines, or shallow water sailors? All of the above. All of the above. Can you tell me, um, according to recent... I, I might add, sir, uh, yes, sir. From, from the other agencies of government, too, uh, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, uh, Intelligence Community, uh, Department of Energy, Diplomatic Security is on the team. And this is... Uh, this is part of your secure, special security force or no, team? No, this is the interagency component of the foreign emergency support team. They are all highly trained? Very much so. Uh, SWAT? Um, well, we, we are not the operators. We are the facilitators and the people that, that, that bring the, the operation and coordinate all aspects of, of a response. So we are not the door kickers is the uh, some term of art these days. We are not door kickers. Okay. So, but you sh share a common ethos, if I'm not under, if, if I'm not mistaken. Absolutely. Never leave anyone behind. Always watch your buddies six o'clock, and lead by example. Is that a safe thing to say? That would be a great summary. Great. So, um, uh, according to recent media reports, at least 15 special operators and highly skilled State Department security staff were available in Tripoli, but were not dispatched to aid Americans under attack in Benghazi. Why were these personnel not deployed to rescue the Americans in Benghazi? I cannot answer that. I was not on the ground. Mr. Hicks? It, it's, yes. Okay. I'm not sure that number, that number is accurate. Um, we did deploy people to Benghazi. Uh, the first team went with seven members at midnight. The second team left at about 6.30 or 7 a.m. that morning. We could not deploy all of our security personnel because we still had about 55 diplomatic personnel in Tripoli that were under threat for attack. Thank you very much. And I yield the rest of my time to the gentleman, Mr. Gowdy. I thank the gentleman. Uh, Mr. Hicks, all right, we're going back to that email. You're on the distribution. And, and, and just so it's clear, Mr. Chairman, I, nothing would thrill me more than to release this email. And it's certainly not classified. We all had access to it. All you had to go, do was go downstairs in the basement and, and look through it. So I hope that my colleagues on the other side of the aisle will be as full-throated in calling for the State Department to release this evidence as they are uh, when they're unhappy with us. So against that backdrop, this email was sent on September the 12th, and I want to read you a little quote from Ambassador Rice. Well, Jake, first of all, it's important to know that there's an FBI investigation that has begun. This is on September 16th that has begun. It has not begun in Benghazi, has it? No, it has not. All right, and it will take some time to be completed. Uh, I was an average prosecutor, but I did it for a long time. 
So l l let me ask you this. Are you aware of any crime scene that has improved with time? <laughs> I'm not a criminal investigator, but... All right. Trust me when I tell you crime scenes do not get better with time. They're unsecured, which means people have access to them. They can walk through them. They can compromise the evidence. Would you agree with me that you would want to talk to witnesses as close to the event as you possibly can? It seems reasonable. Right. And you would want to search incidents as close to the time as you possibly can. Again, seems reasonable. Right. So Ambassador Rice is telling the media that the FBI investigation has begun when she's also talking about a video. And the reality is, and this is the point I want to drive home, the reality is it was a direct result of what she said that the Bureau did not get to Benghazi in a timely fashion. Is that true or is that not true? That is my belief. All right. You used the word immeasurable, that what she said was immeasurable in its damage. I want you to try to measure immeasurable. Tell me what you meant by that. The FBI team was delayed. The Libyan government could not secure the compound. The, it was visited by numerous people. Uh, uh, one of the items that was taken from the compound was uh, Chris's diary, which through the extraordinary efforts of David McFarland, we were able to retrieve and return back to the department. There were other documents that were published that another journalist uh, managed to acquire while visiting the compound. So it made achieving the objective of getting the FBI to Benghazi very, very difficult and to, the ability of them to achieve their mission more difficult. I thank the gentleman. We now go to the gentleman from Florida, Mr. DeSantis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I think this is important hearing. It really does make all the difference to me um, to know whether we did all we could to aid uh, our brethren who are in harm's way. I think it's part of our military ethos. I think it's part of our national character. Mr. Hicks, I just just to uh, uh, go back and get this, you know, even though you believed help was needed, there was a soft unit, special operations unit order to stand down, correct? Yes. And even though you thought air support was needed, there was no air support sent? No air support was sent. So no AC-130 gunships, no fighter planes, right? Uh, AC-130 gunships were never mentioned to me, only fighter planes out of Aviano. And in fact, there was no request for airspace other than the UAV request to the Libyan uh, government, right? Yes, and that preceded the attack, if I'm not mistaken. So when the order to stand down was given, who issued that order? Were you told that Lieutenant Colonel Gibson told you who was ultimately responsible for issuing that order? He did not identify the person. Okay, so you don't know if it was the combatant commander? I, I do not know. Or whether it was the Secretary of Defense or the President, correct? I have no idea. And have you, since this incident has happened and you've been interviewed, have you been enlightened as to who was ultimately responsible for issuing the stand-down order? I think you, that the right person to pose that question to is Lieutenant Colonel Gibson. When you spoke with Secretary Clinton at 2 a.m., uh, did she express support for giving military assistance to those folks in Benghazi, i.e., did she say that she would request such support from either the Secretary of Defense or the President of the United States? We actually didn't discuss that issue. At the time, we were focused on trying to find and hopefully rescue Ambassador uh, Stevens. That was the primary purpose of our discussion. Secondary purpose was to talk about uh, what we were going to do in Tripoli in order to enhance our security there. So as part of that discussion, though, you informed her that you guys in Benghazi were, in fact, under attack, correct? The, the attack at, in Benghazi, she was aware of the attacks, but we were in phase three. The attacks had already, the first two attacks had been completed, and it was a, there was a lull in Benghazi at the time. So, you know, and again, the focus was on finding the Ambassador Stevens and what the second or, or the, the Tripoli response team was going to do. Um, we had at that time no expectation that there would be subsequent attacks at, at our annex in Benghazi. 
So you, you, it was under your, you viewed it as secured at that point? No, we knew the situation was in flux. Okay. Um, when you spoke to the President following the attack on the phone, um, did he uh, say anything about deploying assets, whether why assets were not deployed? I believe I spoke to him on September 17th or September 18th. So. That, right. Um, after the attack. I know this was several days later. Did he, did he say anything or was it just to commend you about your service? It, it was just a call to thank me for service okay. and well, praise the whole team. Uh, I appreciate that. I, I think that this has been a good hearing. I think that there are still questions uh, remaining. I think we need to know who actually gave the order to stand down. I'd like to know why you've been demoted, uh, why they, um, the Secretary's Chief of Staff, uh, called you and, and spoke with you the way she did. Um, and so with that, I will yield, Would the gentleman yield, yield to moment? the Chairman. Thank you. Committee Chairman. Always the right answer. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Hicks, two in the morning. Secretary of State calls you personally, not a common call. No, sir. Did she ask you about the cause of the attack? Did she ask, ask about videos? Did she ask about anything at all that would have allowed you to answer the question of how Benghazi came to be attacked, as far as you know? I don't recall that being part of the conversation. So she wasn't interested in the cause of the attack, and this was the only time you talked directly to the Secretary where you could have told her or not told her about the cause of the attack? It was the, yes, that was the only time when I could have. But again, I had already reported that the attack was, had commenced and that Twitter feeds were asserting that Ansara Sharia was responsible for so the attack. You didn't have that discussion with her only because it was Assume that since you had already reported that the cause of the attack was essentially ex Islamic extremists, some of them linked to al-Qaeda. Yes. Thank you. I thank the gentleman. Uh, the, okay. Uh, the gentleman, does the gentleman yield back? The gentleman yields back. We now probably go to a second round, starting with Mr. Jordan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Hicks, in my first round, uh, I ask you about Cheryl Mills, and you indicated in your response that this is a call that you always take but, frankly, don't want to get. Uh, Cheryl Mills is the counselor to the secretary. Uh, she is chief of staff to Hillary Clinton. And is it, is, it a common, is it common knowledge that of anyone in the State Department, when, then, when the chief of staff to the secretary calls, that is the perception that she is speaking on behalf of the secretary herself? No. But is, is, not necessarily. Not necessarily? But, but is the perception that it's um, pretty darn important based on your response earlier? Absolutely. Yeah, so you, you got this call. I want to go back to, the, um, to, the Chaffetz, uh, to Congressman Chaffetz's visit there. You were instructed that there was going to be an attorney accompanying Mr. Chaffetz, and this attorney was to be next to you at all times. I mean, here's what I'm trying to get at. The Secretary has said nobody, she, in front of the Senate, nobody is more committed to getting this right. If the intent is to get it right and get to the truth, then why this concerted effort to shield the interaction of Congressman Chaffetz from you? That's what I'm not figuring out. If we want to get to the truth, shouldn't you and Mr. Chaffetz be able to have a dialogue and conversation without some babysitter from the State Department, some lawyer there monitoring, taking notes, calling back, doing all things that this individual did on that congressional visit? I should be able to have a conversation with the congressman if he wants to. And didn't you say, in my, in, in, excuse me, uh, Mr. Didn't you say, Mr. Hicks, in my first round that this was the first and only time this had ever happened where someone from the State Department accompanied a congressional visit and you were instructed specifically by the State Department, do not talk to Congressman Chaffetz or anyone on the committee's delegation who is there without this lawyer being present. That's correct. And shortly after the one time when you did have a chance to interact with Mr. Chaffetz and the lawyer was not present, when it was not present you got a phone call from Cheryl Mills. That's correct. And on that phone call, what did she say? She asked for a report on the visit, which I provided. Uh, the tone of the report 
the tone of her voice was um, unhappy, as I recall it. Uh, but I faithfully reported exactly how the visit uh, transpired. I described the content of the briefing that — Can I interrupt you right there, Mr. Yes. Hicks? Were you in a classified briefing at the time and were pulled out of that briefing to talk to Ms. Mills? I recall the phone call afterwards. Okay. I, I was pulled out um, of the briefing, but I, I don't recall that that was the time when I talked to Councillor Mills. What were you pulled out of the briefing for? Um, I actually, actually can't remember, to okay. be honest with you. But in close proximity to the time you had the briefing, the one time you were apart from the minder from the State Department, you, got, you received a call from Ms. Mills? Yes. Okay. Um, I, I, I guess, Mr. Chairman, I just, I just want to stress, I mean, this is, this is the equivalent of Rahm Emanuel, when he, when he is Chief of Staff, when he calls, to put my colleagues on the other side, when he calls, you take the call. You understand that is important, and you understand that he is representing the White House. When Cheryl Mills calls, you understand, everyone in the State Department understands, this is the person right next to Secretary Clinton. And the fact that we had, for the first time in Mr. Hicks's 22-year history of serving this country, someone accompany a congressman on a visit after we lost four American lives, and that individual has to be in every single meeting. There can't be personal interaction between these two discussing what took place. It is completely unprecedented. With that, I would be happy Wait, to yield. The gentleman yield. be happy to yield to the chairman. Mr. Hicks, you and I have known each other uh, throughout the Middle East for a number of years. Uh, but in all my years of traveling in the Middle East, any time I was head of a congressional delegation, I had a one-on-one -on -one with the ambassador, often in an automobile going to see a head of state or something else. Over the years that you have watched great ambassadors, have you ever failed to see the head of a delegation coming get a one-on-one? -on -one? Isn't that part of sort of the ceremony of that relationship and how you treat the head of a congressional delegation? Not just this is an exception, but isn't it always a one-on-one -on -one meeting at some point during a, a leadership meeting? In every CODEL that I have been involved in, that has been standard. So they were telling you to, uh, a non-Senate confirmed, a political appointee of the Secretary of State, her right-hand person, was telling you to breach protocol? Well, I, the, the two lawyers did. The conversation, oh, the two the, the conversation with Councillor Mills occurred after. Okay. So it, it was, in fact, people sent by the State Department told you to breach protocol and not provide anything, even if requested by uh, my personal emissary, Mr. Chaffetz, on that CODEL. Told you not to, not to talk to him privately, even if he asked. That is correct. Thank you. I thank the gentleman for yielding. We now go to the ranking member, Mr. Cummings. Mr. Hicks, I was just uh, listening to your testimony, and I, it's, um, during your interview with the committee, you were asked point blank, and that certainly that was closer to the time that this happened, whether anyone at the Department instructed you to withhold information from Representative Chavis. At any time during that trip, you were asked, and I quote, did you receive any direction about information that Congressman Chavis shouldn't be given from Washington? And you replied, uh, no, I did not. Um, is that is that still your testimony? I'm not just saying this is just one testimony. I'm just looking at the testimony. You don't remember that? I recall saying that I was instructed not to allow personal interviews with the the. Uh, I'm not trying to twist you up. I, I'm just going I, on, on what I, I understand. What I, but I recall also stating that I was not to allow personal interviews between Congressman Chaffetz, the RSO, the acting DCM, and, or me. Okay. So, so, so in other words, you did say that you were told to make sure that other State Department officials were present. Is that right? Is that what, That's correct. Present for yeah. meetings with Rep Representative Chaffetz. And That's correct. As you stated, and they told me not to be isolated with Congressman Chaffetz. Is That's that correct? correct? They didn't tell you not to say say anything, but they said not, don't be isolated. I guess they, they said not to, not to have a personal interview with him. Yeah. 
yeah, j by yourself. I'm just trying to make. I'm just. I'm not trying to. I, I understand. I'm just trying to be clear. That's all. I, I understand. I understand okay. what you're. Okay. Now, um, Mr. Hicks, you said that uh, four military personnel were told not to board that plane, and that this call. You don't know where it came from. That's what you said a few minutes ago, um, and so. So you did not know that it came from the Special Operations Command Africa? I, I knew it came from Special Operations Command Africa. I do not you know, know the individual. Who. I did not know who. I got you. Ted, I just wanted to clear that up because it wasn't clear. That, that's okay. Thank you. On October 1, 2012, the Secretary of State convened an accountability review board led by uh, Thomas Pickering, Ambassador uh, Admiral M Michael Mullen, to investigate the attacks in Benghazi. Uh, after interviewing more than 100 uh, people, viewing hours of videotape and reviewing thousands of pages of documents, the ARB issued a very thorough report in December tw uh, 2012, setting forth the, for the results of its review. Uh, Mr. Hicks, did you meet with the ARB as part of that investigation? I had an interview with them for about two hours. Okay. And Mr. Nordstrom, did you meet with the ARB as a part of the investigation? Yes, on multiple occasions. Um, it is my understanding that a cable went out to every employee at the State Department informing them of how to contact the ARB if they wanted to bring information forward. Uh, Mr. Thompson, did you receive that notice? I did. All right. And did you contact the ARB and request to meet with them? I did. And so did you end up meeting with the ARB as part of their review? I did not. Did, you, did anyone try to stop you from meeting with the ARB? No. <laughs> Earlier this week, Congressman Chavis claimed that the AARB report was incomplete because they never even interviewed Secretary Clinton. According to Ambassador Pickering, the AARB met with uh, Secretary Clinton near the end of their investigation, and during that time uh, they had the opportunity to discuss the report with her and could have asked her any questions uh, they wanted. Ambassador Pickering and Admiral Mullen have put out a, a joint statement. I was just saying, I think that very clearly says they didn't interview her. They just talked about the report and could have, but didn't ask her. Is that right? They. I think it makes his they, case. Well, well, that's why we we need to have. No, I'm not trying to make any case. I'm just trying to get out the facts. Mr. But I do. That's even more reason why we need to have Pickering in here, and I'm glad you've agreed to do that. And I just want to finish this question because I want to stay within the time limits. Mm -hmm. uh, Ambassador Pickering and Admiral Mullen have put out a joint statement that based on their thorough independent investigation, they assigned responsibility based on where they thought the responsibility lay. And that was not on Secretary Clinton. And, and, and this is what they said. And I quote, from the beginning of the ARB process, we had unfettered access to everyone and everything, including all the documentation we needed. Our marching orders were to get to the bottom of what happened, and that's what we did, end of quote. I uh, just wanted to, and again, we will, as you said, Mr. Nordstrom, we want to get a complete picture, and we'll hopefully be getting that complete picture very soon so that we can get to the point that we want to, and that is the reform so that this, these kinds of things uh, are prevented from happening again. Thank you. I thank the gentleman. We now go to the gentleman from Utah, Mr. Chaffetz. And, uh, thank you, Chairman. I would say to the ranking member, Mr. Cummings, who I have the utmost respect for in every way, shape, or form, I totally concur with you. We, too, just like the ARB, should have unfettered access to all the information, all the witnesses, and all the documents. We, as a, should, as a committee, should stand up for ourselves and demand that all the unclassified documents be released so we all can look at them at the same time, at the same thing. So, Would I you think, yield for five seconds? Sure. I agree. <laughs> I yield back. Thank you. One. Yeah, one. <laughs> Play basketball. Huh? Mr. Nordstrom. Um, it's pretty clear for me, to me from the, from the October hearing that there were a number of security recommendations that, were, that you wanted to see done on the ground. Did, at any time during your service there, did you ever get everything that you wanted? Did, were the recommendations that you were making, for, making forward, did they, were you actually able to implement those security recommendations? Very few of them. Very few of them. Mr. Hicks, is it fair to say that the, the people on the ground trying to make the security decisions, that they were not able to get the resources, they weren't able to fortify the facility, they didn't have the personnel that they requested? Is that fair to say? Yes, it's fair to say. 
when I saw Secretary Clinton four and a half months after the attack in Benghazi testify before the United States Congress that she didn't make the security decisions, you made the security decisions, Mr. Nordstrom. You're the regional security officer on the ground. You are the chief security person. You're the ones that made the security decisions. True or false? The response I got from the regional director when I raised the issues that we were short of our standards for physical security was that my, quote, tone was not helpful. So true or false? The security decisions on the ground in Libya were made by you. I would have liked to have thought, but apparently no. Mr. Hicks, when you heard and saw that, did you have a reaction to it? What's your personal opinion? I was, uh, when I was there, I was very frustrated by the situation, uh, at times even frightened by the threat scenario that we were looking at relative to the resources we had to try to mitigate that threat scenario. And to the leadership of this committee on both sides of the aisle, I find it stunning that four and a half months after the attack, Secretary Clinton still has the gall to say, it wasn't us, it was them. I take full responsibility, but I'm not going to hold anybody accountable but it was them that made the decisions. That was not the case. I yield to the gentleman from Ohio. I thank the gentleman. M Mr. Nordstrom, uh, you testified in October there were 200 and some security incidences in Libya the 13 months prior to the attack. Is that correct? That's correct. Repeated uh, attempts to, to, to breach the, the facility there. You repeatedly asked for additional security personnel and it was denied, correct? That's correct. Not only denied, but it was reduced, correct? That's correct. And then four and a half months after it all happens, the Secretary of State says, you were responsible for the security situation in Libya. That's what we have. That is exactly what we have. You repeatedly asked, send us some more of the good guys. They said, we can't do it. In fact, we're going to take some of them away. You guys are on your own. They made that decision in Washington. In fact, Mr. Nordstrom, the hearing ended in October. The, hearing, the only hearing we had last fall before an election hearing ended with you referring to the folks in Washington, your superiors, who wouldn't give you what you needed you referring to them as the Taliban. Is that correct? Yes. Remember that? Can you, can you remember that I'm, statement you made? Yeah, I've, I've had a lot of questions about that uh, metaphor. Yeah. Understand. But for them to say, now you're responsible for the security situation, flies in the face of fact. I yield back to the gentleman. Uh, thank the gentleman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, one of the things I see in the Accountability Review Board, page 37, that I just find First of all, I want to highlight, quote, Embassy Tripoli staff showed absolute dedication and teamwork in mobilizing to respond to the crisis with the DCM, and then it goes on there, naming you specifically for your heroism and for your work. That's what I saw. I could see it in your eyes, and I could see it in the others. God bless you for the great work that you did. But the next paragraph, Mr. Chairman, I have a real problem with. It says, in the third sentence, the board found no evidence of any undue delays or decision making or denial of support from Washington or from the military combatant commanders. And as we have heard today, that is not true. And the next sentence is the most troubling. Quite the contrary, the safe evacuation of all U.S. government personnel from Benghazi 12 hours after the initial attack, that's not true. There are four people that were not safely evacuated. And at the very beginning of the ARP, it says, quote, those who cannot remember the past are commended, are condemned to repeat it. I think that's true. We always have to remember them. And we can't allow this ARB to say that everybody was safely evacuated, because they weren't. But there was an awful lot of heroism. I thank the gentleman. Well that's so true. We now go to the gentlelady from New York, Ms. Maloney. Thank you. And I, I agree with Mr. Chavez completely that there should be equal exchange of information, that we should have access to all information. But the Democratic minority was denied access to a witness. The only way we knew anything about what Mr. Thompson was going to say was what we read in the press. Now, there should be equal access to witnesses, and there should be equal access to information. Would the gentleman yield? Uh, on your time. May I? I well, hold the clock. Uh, because okay. you made an allegation, I don't understand. 
We, we, we didn't have a transcribed interview with two out of the three witnesses. Mr. Thompson was not made available to either. Mr. Nordstrom was, in fact, a previous witness, and we felt that there was sufficient information about what he felt. And Mr. Hicks, I think he went through five hours on a bipartisan basis. Uh, we forwarded their, their statements, not ours, their statements. We participated not at all in preparation. We forwarded them to the minority as we got them, period. So I'm a little bit concerned only in that mm -hmm. it, it, there's, nothing, there's nothing fair about partisan politics, but I believe we've fully complied deliberately with the spirit of the rules all along. Uh, so I would hope the gentlelady, when better informed, would appreciate that, that uh, we uh, we've tried to be very forthcoming. Now, remember, these but are whistleblowers. Mr. Chairman, I, I, we are, I'm all for equality, and, I, and we did get uh, copies of uh, Mr. Hicks's statements and Mr. Nordstrom. But your staff met with Mr. Thompson. Our staff was not allowed to meet with Mr. Thompson. But he's represented. He's, no, it's just not true. I'm, I'm, no, you, you didn't meet with him. We, no, it's true that we have, some, have had some meetings with him, but we, we haven't prohibited or in any way. He's not our witness. But the gentleman later yields. He's Absolutely. a whistleblower that came forward. Yeah, let, let, me, let me. I'm so glad we are stopping the clock. You, you are stopping the clock, but we need to clear this up. Um, well, I don't think there's anything to clear up. No, These I'm just a whistleblower. Yeah, and, and, and we want to protect whistleblowers. That's very, very important to us. We, the first thing, we, we have not gotten a syllable. Uh, from, you've had conversations with Mr. Thompson. We've never had a conversation with, with Mr. Thompson. I see you looking over here, Mr. Gowdy, and you know that's not fair. And so, what, so all I'm saying to you is that it, it's, we have a witness that came in here today that you had an opportunity to interview. Well, I, I appreciate that. The, the, and we never had that opportunity. The, the, well, you know what? Stop the clock for one second. One, one quick question. I'm asking the witnesses. Mr. Thompson, is it your decision who you talk to, and did we ever, any of my people ever tell you not to talk to the Democratic minority? And I'm not accusing you of that. No. Okay. Mr. Hicks, have we ever suggested that you not talk to the minority, any of their people? No. Mr. Nordstrom, has anyone on my staff or any of my members ever asked you not to speak to them? No. In fact, I spoke with both, both sides. Thank you. That's resolved. The gentlelady may continue. Well, we did request to meet with Mr. Thompson, and through his lawyer, he said no. But he did speak to the, to the uh, Republican staff. I, I'd, I'd like to go back to Mr. Chavitz's uh, or other people's questioning about uh, Cheryl Mills's uh, phone call. And in reading the transcripts of it, uh, Mr. Hicks, uh, you, you, you told our investigators that she did not seem happy when she heard that no other State Department official was in the classified briefing. Is that, is that true? She was unhappy that her minder, her, uh, the, the lawyer that came with Congressman Chaffetz was not included in that meeting. Was she unhappy that no other State Department official was included? That, just that State Department official? That State Department okay. official. And, and you also said that she never criticized you. And according to your interview transcript, you said she never gave you any direct criticism. Do you stand by that statement today? The statement was clearly no direct criticism, but the tone of the conversation, and again, this is part of the Department of State culture, the fact that she called me and the tone of her voice, and we're trained to gauge tone and nuance in language, indicated to me very strongly that she was unhappy. And I just, okay, if I may... Go, go, my time is limited. Going okay. to the uh, a diplomatic post in uh, Benghazi, as I understand it, uh, the uh, British ambassador's convoy was attacked uh, a gentleman was killed, and they decided to pull out of Benghazi. Is that correct? I don't believe anyone was killed. I believe we saved w the okay. life of one of uh, one of those people. And I'd like shot. to defer to Eric and, because no, he no, was actually your the point, there. The, my question is: Did the British ambassador close the post in Benghazi and leave? He did. He did. did Do you I think it was wise for that though? He they. Excuse me, claiming my time, I, I will yield if somebody wants me to yield, but I wanted to ask, when we continued to stay there, do you think that was a wise decision for us to continue to stay in Benghazi after the English uh, had closed their post and, and left? Absolutely. Why was it important for us to stay in Benghazi? We needed to stay there as a symbolic gesture to a people that we saved from mm. Uh, Gaddafi during the revolution. 
as we know, Gaddafi's forces were on the doorstep of Benghazi right before the NATO bombing commenced. Mm -hmm. And as a gesture, again, as I said before, Chris went there to be, as a symbolic gesture, to support the dream of the people of Benghazi to have a democracy. And so he shared your position that staying there was incredible. And he also b understood from the secretary herself mm -hmm. that Benghazi was important to us and that we needed to make it to be a permanent constituent post. Mm -hmm. Now, I agree with my uh, good friend on the other side of the aisle, Trey, that uh, it was a long time before the FBI got on the ground. And uh, as I understand it from a report that they gave us, they got the visas right away. Uh, the day of the Ambassador Rice's appearance on the Sunday shows, September 16, the Libyan government granted the FBI the visas so that the team could travel to Libya. Their flight clearance was granted the following day on September 17, and the FBI arrived in Tripoli on September 18. And according to this report, the team could not travel to Benghazi for some time due to the security situation on the ground. Is, is that true? Were all of our people out of Benghazi? And were we not letting anyone in Benghazi? What exactly was happening then, uh, Mr. Hicks? Yes, the Libyan government did not want any of our personnel to go to Benghazi mm -hmm. because of the security situation there. So when, when the FBI went to Benghazi, it was when the Libyan government felt that it was secure enough for them to go there. Is that a fair statement? We strung together a series of approvals at the mid to upper levels from the government and organized an es a military escort to go with the uh, FBI and special forces mm -hmm. troops that escorted them as well. Thank you. The gentlelady's time has expired. We now go to her friend, Mr. Trey Gowdy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I am, uh, I, I am trying to reconcile how Benghazi was not safe enough for the Federal Bureau of Investigation to go, but it was safe enough to leave a below-spec facility for our diplomats to stay in. I'm, I'm just trying to reconcile those two points. It's too dangerous for the Bureau, who are trained law enforcement officials, but it's just fine for diplomats. Uh, at some point, I'll reconcile that. Uh, let me do this, Mr. Hicks. I'm going to dust off something called the best evidence rule. The best evidence of what you said when you were asked about Mr. Chaffetz's visit is actually what you said. So here it is. Those instructions were to arrange the visit in such a way that Representative Chaffetz and his staff would not have the opportunity to interview myself, John Martinic, and David McFarlane alone. That's what you said. End of deposition. So there shouldn't be any ambiguity about who said what when. That's your testimony. Now, I, I'd like to try to weave this tapestry together because this will be the last opportunity I have certainly today to talk to you. If I understand your testimony correctly, Mr. Hicks, and I want to be fair about it, so if I mischaracterize anything, you need to correct me. If I understand your testimony in part, the ambassador was interested in going to Benghazi because of interest that Secretary Clinton had in Benghazi. Is that fair? That's fair. All right. Now, Mr. Norsom, same thing to you. And if I'm unfair in my characterization, you need to correct me. I thought I understood your testimony to be that Secretary Clinton alone was able to approve facilities that were below specs. That's correct. Part of the specs. Certain, certain. Uh, there's two. There's two categories. SECA and OSPB. She can uh, is the only one that can authorize waivers for SECA. In this case, both apply because we didn't meet either. So we are able to show that in part he went to Benghazi because of Secretary Clinton. In part, Benghazi was still open despite the fact it was below specs because of Secretary Clinton. And now to my third point, to complete the circle. Who is Cheryl Mills? Counselor and Chief of Staff to the Secretary. And she was copied on that email that I know my colleagues on the other side of the aisle are going to have a press conference on as soon as we get out of here, calling on the State Department to release this email. I know it. 
because I have heard all afternoon about denying access to documents, and they do not want to deny the public or the media access to this document. So I know they're going to call on the State Department to release this non-classified email which Cheryl Mills was copied on, which demonstrably undercuts Susan Rice's talking points. And Cheryl Mills was copied on that email. Mr. Gowdy, if I could add, uh, Cheryl Mills was also the person that led our preparation for um, our October testimony. I had never met her before, but that was explained to me who she was afterwards. And apparently, uh, she was also less than pleased with Mr. Chaffetz's uh, visit to um, Libya, if I understood that testimony correctly, uh, which I find stunning. He's a subcommittee chairman on oversight, one of the more decent human beings I've ever met. I've never known him to inspire that strong of emotion in anyone other than Ms. Mills. Uh, let me say this to you, Ambassador, in, in conclusion. Uh, you have made uh, a compelling case today for why it is important to tell other countries the truth. You made a compelling case that the decision not to tell the truth on Sunday morning talk shows adversely impacted our ability to get to Benghazi. You made a compelling case. All three of you have made a compelling case today on why it is important for government to tell the truth to its own citizens. So you made the case why we have to tell the truth to other countries, and you made the case on why you have to tell the truth to your own citizens. So if anyone wants to know what difference does it make, if anyone wants to ask what difference does it make, it always matters whether or not you can trust your government. And to the families, we're going to find out what happened in Benghazi, and I don't give a damn whose career is impacted. We're going to find out what happened. And with that, I would, would yield Would the gentleman yield? I'll be happy to. We're going to be winding down. There's a vote call, but I want to ask each of you, you're whistleblowers. You're the kind of people that give us information we wouldn't otherwise have. Do you believe what you're doing today is what we need to keep doing? In other words, do we need other whistleblowers to come forward, other fact witnesses who know what we don't currently know? And I'm not asking you to ask if this was a great process or you enjoyed it, but was it worthwhile, in your opinion, uh, as people who have now gone through this process? Mr. Thompson? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hicks? Yes, I do. Mr. Nordstrom? Absolutely. Well, since we're going Mr. Lankford next, I hope you continue to feel that way. Mr. Lankford. Mr. Norton, I just need to follow up on a conversation we had earlier dealing with the uh, cable that you said Mar March the 28th, 2012. You had mentioned that you drafted that cable requesting additional uh, personnel uh, for both the embassy in Tripoli and in Benghazi because you were very much short and uh, as time was expiring and they were, the SST team were leaving, you knew you were not going to have enough people. You mentioned you drafted the cable. Your intention was and your assumption was the executive leadership, including the undersecretary, all the way to the secretary, would see that cable or at least be briefed on that cable and the request uh, for that security. There has been a lot of uh, discussion about the, res the official response that came back on April the 19th. Who, who do you think saw or the intention or at least reflected the opinion of when that cable came back to you? When that cable response came back to you, who was the assumption that was actually responding to you? Uh, normally, someone would tell me exactly who it is or they would indicate who the point of contact was. Uh, if I recall correctly, uh, that is still unknown to me. Uh, I assume that it is coming from DS, but as I uh, testified to before, so many of these decisions seem to be at uh, Ambassador Kennedy's level or higher. Clearly, that, that was cleared by some of those other officials. All right, so you are assuming this is the Under Secretary or on up somewhere that it had personal knowledge of that? It certainly saw it ahead of, of time. The, of that cable that came back. It is an established fact that there is video of the attack. There are clear vi uh, video of, it, of the attackers of the night. The FBI has done an extensive investigation. We are now months past that time. Are any of you aware of anyone who has been held to account for the murders that happened in Libya? Anyone detained? Anyone arrested? Anyone captured? Are you aware of anything that has happened to any of the attackers to hold them to account? Uh, neither the, the perpetrators nor the persons that made decisions. Again, the four people that were named in the ARB were put on uh, administrative leave. Uh, I understand one of them is trying to come back off of that leave and go to be the RSO in, in NATO, which is shocking to me. So at this point, no one is aware of anyone who has been held to account in any way for the, for the murder of four Americans? 
not that I'm aware of. In 1998, we've discussed frequently, there was the bombing of the embassy in Kenya and Tanzania. There was an ARB at the end of that as well. And let me just read you the three findings at the end of that ARB in, that was done in 1999. It said this, number one, State Department of Washington did not assess the threats or take notes of the clear warning signs and escalating threats. Number two, it noted the facility was inadequate for even the most modest of attack. And number three, there was a lack of preparations or warning systems at the facility. That could have been written a month ago. We have discussed often on this, the one thing we have to do is learn the lesson. In 1998, the, the same thing occurred, and we have not learned the lesson. What we know of today, and the realities that have come out and through all the, that you have contributed to this conversation, and what you have contributed is invaluable, is that we did not do the most basic minimum security that was required by the State Department standards set after the bombings in Nairobi, Kenya, and in Tanzania. We did not do the basics. We did not provide the level of security. There were, in fact, cameras that were in the box still in Benghazi because a technical person had never been sent to actually install those, and so there could have been additional warning signs, but they had not actually been installed and done. We know that the Tripoli facility was even at a greater risk than Benghazi. There were even more vulnerabilities in Tripoli than there were in Benghazi's, both in physical security around the facility and in actual staffing of people that are the gun toters, as you mentioned before, the door kickers and such, people that would actually be there, be there to be able to provide that security. The minimum level was not provided. In fact, my understanding, Mr. Hicks, is that it reached such a point of vulnerability that you actually approached some of the diplomatic security and asked for the diplomats to be trained in how to handle a gun because there was such a fear of the people on the ground because you were so exposed. Is that true? It's true. We have got to learn the lessons of the past. This happened in 1998. We allowed it to happen again. The State Department has to put into practice their own standards and put into place the things we know to be right. We cannot allow a, a place that's listed as critical and high risk to our personnel to be ignored and to not have the support they need. If there's any one gain that we can do in any one way to be able to honor those that have fallen is that we actually do learn the lesson and we protect our diplomats with what is required. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. I thank the gentleman. We now go to the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Micah. Uh, Mr. Hicks, did you have something you wanted to say? Yes, I'd just like to make a clarification with respect of course. to the conversation with uh, the ranking member. There is no inherent contradiction between denying or avoiding a private interview with someone and making sure that he has information available. I just want to be clear on that. Mr. Micah. Thank you. Um, Mr. Nordstrom, I, I don't think I've ever read so much testimony, but uh, what you provided last night I thought was particularly informative. Uh, and uh, talking about the, uh, uh, the, on page 7, you talk about the rating level assigned for uh, threat categories for our various posts. Mm -hmm. And there are four of them, critical, high, medium, and low. And we have 264 posts that, uh, uh, where, where we had uh, um, security concerns, uh, overseas diplomatic posts at the time of Benghazi. There were 14 posts rated as either high or critical, not a huge number, but 14. Two of them, uh, two of the posts were Benghazi and Tripoli. Are you aware of that, Mr. Thompson? Mr. Nordstrom, you put it in there. So it's not like you, they had this incredible array of posts that were on this high alert. Is that correct? That's my understanding. The very yeah. small amount were, were high or uh, critical. And then uh, finally, um, again, all, I have not read the classified. I read the unclassified version. Mr. Chaffetz pointed out later in the report where it looks like they, they tried to cook this uh, to put blame basically on the lower level. There's a certain <laughs> plateau, and then everybody below gets the blame. Uh, up on page four, when I had my time before, I said, uh, Embassy Tripoli, this is from the report, did not demonstrate strong and sustained advocacy with Washington for increased security for uh, Special Mission Benghazi. And yet, we've heard your predecessor, Mr. Hicks, 
pleaded for additional help. You pleaded for it. It's documented, and you didn't get it. You actually got a reduction. Is that correct, as was pointed out? Yes, a yeah. drastic reduction. So it wasn't like this was all over the place. Finally, um, for the ARB, you put in here to ignore the role of senior department leadership played before, during, and after the September 11th attack sends a clear message to all State Department employees. It looks like uh, they're whitewashing the folks at the higher pay grades and levels and you all are taking the blame. Is that a fair assessment? I think the basic message is that whether or not you are sitting out at the post requesting resources, preparing for testimony before this committee, or standing on a building surrounded by an armed mob attacking you, the message is the same. You are on your own. Mr. Hicks? I share what Mr. Nordstrom had to say. Mr. Thompson, and I still can't believe that you were never interviewed, uh, and you had one of the most strategic positions uh, by the ARB, the, and that, that is true? I will let you use strategic, sir. But, uh, well, <laughs> well, it is it, a, a tool that should be, remain on the menu of, of options is probably my, my basic point. Okay. And it, was, it was early taken off the menu. It is a very sad commentary. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Well, gentlemen, yield. Yeah, I, well, I have got time. Uh, thank yeah. you. I, I, I think what we have heard here today clearly is that in the future, RSOs, Deputy Chief of Missions, Chief of Missions, need to put everything in a cable. In the future, when you know there is a security problem and you are being told your application would not be helpful, it would not be wanted, or people say just be patient, or they say don't put it in a cable. The answer is the next ARB will probably whitewash the same as this one. On October 10th, Ranking Member and I and many others sat through a hearing in which it was made very clear that message after message after message, including the actual, if you will, open source information about the attacks that occurred on other diplomatic missions and our own. If that is not saying loudly, they blew a hole in our wall, when are you going to give us the security we need, then I am afraid the deafness at at least under Secretary Kennedy's level is not in any way curable by technology known to amplify sound. So with that, this hearing is closed, but this investigation is not over.